Um, so I want to uh, welcome on our guest today. Elizabeth is a person we've had the pleasure uh, of working with for many years at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So much of our work that we do interpreting the yard and, and developing tours is dependent upon the wonderful collections um, that they have at the at the um, Brooklyn Navy Yard archives. Elizabeth is also going to talk to us about um, the other aspects of her job that maybe you wouldn't see if you visited a place like Building 92 or came on one of our tours. Um, Great. Um, hi, welcome. Hi, <laughs> good afternoon, and, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, I also want to thank uh, Turnstile Tours for the opportunity to host this event. Um, I have attended many of their tours, both in person and virtual, and their commitment to public engagement and cultural heritage is truly unparalleled. Um, so I highly encourage you to become a member and support this really great company. Um, and I would like to welcome you to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The BNYDC archives is both a public entity and an internal department within the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation or BNYDC for short. And our function is information management. We are in the unique position of not only managing current business records for the organization, but also stewarding material about the site and its history that we share with the public. During this program, I'll give you a primer on archives and their purpose explain the mission and history of our organization and department, and end with uh, giving you some time to engage with our collections. So I will take now the opportunity to orient you. So I am here in building 292 in the northeast corner of the yard. This used to be BNYDC headquarters and the storage room for our archival collections and corporate records are still here. And later on, I'll give you a tour of the space. Building 92, which is here, is the yard's visitor center and was the first publicly accessible space on the yard. This is where the permanent exhibition Brooklyn Navy Yard Past, Present, Future is on view and we hope to resume operations soon. And finally, my company's main office is here in building 77. Uh, this is where all administrative staff are located. BNYDC is a nonprofit organization established by the city of New York to fuel economic growth in the borough of Brooklyn. My department, Records Management and Archives, plays a dual role within this organization. Internally, we manage corporate records, but to external parties, we preserve and provide access to the history of the property, from its establishment in 1801 as a shipyard owned and operated by the United States Navy, all the way through present day as a private industrial park owned by the city of New York. As Andrew mentioned, my name is Elizabeth, and I serve as both archivist and records manager, responsible for all our information assets. I train and advise staff on the company's information governance program, as well as see all operations of the archives. So not only do I advise on systems of management for corporate records, but also work to preserve our records of enduring value. I'm advising staff on how to properly manage their files, catalog corporate records that are inactive but need to be kept for legal purposes, developing strategies for preserving digital records, while also overseeing the operations of the archives, which includes responding to research inquiries, both internal and external, and processing special collections. Let me describe what an archives is. An archives is an institution dedicated to collecting, preserving, and providing access to records of enduring value. What that means is the archives are tasked with taking care of records, regardless of format and regardless of size, in the forever term. The process of taking care of this unique material comprises several steps. We store the material, we repair the material, we organize the material, we inventory the material, often we scan the material and put it online, and most importantly, we create pathways and access points for individuals to engage with the material, whether that means just looking at it as you will in a bit, or use the material for research, display, and publication. A term you frequently hear in our profession is provenance, which refers to the history or origin of material in a collection. And this information is important to archivists when they arrange and describe collections. 
Maintaining the original order not only preserves context for the researcher, but also makes the arrangement process much simpler. Provenance of material mandates that archival collections remain distinct bodies while they are in repositories. This respect for groups of records kept together by their creator differs from the more library oriented urge to group individual items by subjects like books or magazines. When you first come into the archives, you'll likely find yourself in the reading room. This is where you'll interact with the archival materials you're researching. But the reading room is only one part of the archives. The archival records themselves are kept in a secure storage area in climate controlled conditions so they will last for many years. Only staff have access to this area to ensure the security and longevity of these materials. And this is the everyday work we do so records can be used well into the future. As the name implies, BNYDC is an economic development corporation that takes an equitable approach to economic development. We provide an enabling environment for manufacturing businesses who create middle-class jobs. And we partner with the local community to ensure access to those opportunities. BNYDC constantly strives to provide an environment in which businesses and careers can take root and grow. During my tenure as archivist, I have been crafting a vision for the archives that is more corporate focused. Our primary user community is BNYDC staff and the Yard's tenant businesses. So we are a corporate archives whose most important asset are the historical architectural plans of the property a sample of which you can see at the bottom left of your screen. The New York Naval Shipyard was established in 1801 with a $40,000 purchase of 42 acres of land adjacent to Wallabout Bay. It would later expand into a 236 acre property that borders the present day Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Williamsburg and Dumbo neighborhoods. By the time the property was decommissioned in 1966, there were 270 buildings, 24 miles of railroad track, 18 miles of paved road, 17,000 feet of berthing space, nine piers, six dry docks and 22 shops housing 98 different trades. Over the course of its history, more than 130 vessels were built at the yard, yet the main mission of the yard was ship repair and technological development. Between 1838 and 1946, there was a naval hospital on site whose function was not critical care, but rest and recuperation. Employment and activity steadily increased during wartime and World War II saw incredible growth in workforce and activity. In the 1940s, nearly 70,000 people reported for work here including women and African-Americans. The yard served as the lead dockyard for battleship construction during the war. And over the course of those four years, built three battleships, two floating workshops, eight tank landing ships, five carriers, countless bargers and lighters, as well as converting more than 250 ships for war duty and repairing 5,000 others. In the post-war years, the Navy gravitated away from the shipbuilding business. This, in addition to the bridges along the East River, which would impede travel for larger ships, contributed to the yard's closing. In 1966, the yard was formally decommissioned by the federal government, and 9,600 people lost their jobs. A year after the decommissioning, the property was purchased for private commercial use. With this purchase, the city made a commitment to reinvest in its historic legacy as a pathway to prosperity for New Yorkers. The Brooklyn Navy Yard was first managed by the Commerce, Labor, and Industry Corporation of Kings, otherwise known as CLIC, and later by BNYDC. Since 1981, BNYDC has been the yard's real estate developer and property manager. When the US Navy decommissioned this property, it packed up all of their belongings and vacated the premises. They left one thing ha behind, however, thousands of architectural plans of the property. And so as the entity entrusted with the guardianship of these historic records, BNYDC embarked on a program in late 2003 to assess inventory and preserve them. The initial goal of the archives was to provide access to these documents to the yard's planners, facilities engineers, and tenants, as well as outside contractors who needed the drawings for yard maintenance and redevelopment. The archives then took on a new commitment to celebrate the yard's rich history which culminated in the opening of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Center at Building 92. 
I'll explain more about Building 92 throughout this presentation. The BNYDC archives collects, organizes, and preserves material relating to the activity and achievement of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The archives makes this material accessible and provides research support to any interested persons who seek to evaluate the impact of the Brooklyn Navy Yard on the history of Brooklyn's social, cultural, and economic development. To date, the archives has preserved over 40,000 historical architectural plans, digitized over 7,000 photographs from the National Archives and Records Administration, and recorded over 75 oral histories, particularly of women who worked at the Navy Yard during World War II. And I wanna make a distinction here. There may be a perception that the BNYDC archives is the archives for Building 92, since many consider Building 92 a museum. The objects on display in Building 92 are under the care of the archives, but we serve our parent organization, BNYDC. Our collection scope does include history of the site, but it has recently expanded to include the legacy of BNYDC. And the archives is cultivating relationships with our many tenant businesses to document institutional memory. During the development of the exhibition, Brooklyn Navy Yard Past, Present, Future, the archives received many small donations from former yard workers. And these were much appreciated, but did not reflect the full story of the yard. Now that the site is an industrial park, our focus is on BNYDC's legacy. As such, our collection scope has shifted to prioritize products made by our tenant businesses. We're not interested in collecting duplicate materials of what is already in our holdings. For example, issues of the shipyard, the shipworker, which was the yard's internal newsletter printed between 1941 and 1966, as we already have the entire run in our collections. We are also not in the position to collect the history of the US Navy. <laughs> and by that, I mean any records, photographs, or artifacts of ships. While ships were built here at the yard, they are the property of the US Navy, and the yard no longer has any connection with the US Navy. Some repositories interested in history related to the Brooklyn Navy Yard are Naval History and Heritage Command, the archives for the US Navy located in the Washington Navy Yard, and the Brooklyn Public Library, in particular, the Center for Brooklyn History, formerly the Brooklyn Historical Society. These institutions have a broader scope where materials may find a more appropriate home instead of our archives. The collections in the BNYDC archives fall under four categories. The crown jewel of the archives are, as I keep mentioning, the architectural drawings and maps of the Brooklyn Navy Yard property. We have drawings dating back to the early 19th century. Staff contact us regularly to see these drawings. They use these primary sources to answer questions about a building, to understand the built environment, to understand previous design decisions that were made. I would also encourage folks that the best way to engage with our collections is through the exhibition Brooklyn Navy Yard Past, Present, Future, as well as our digital library. Most of the special collections in the archives are an extension of that exhibition. As I mentioned, our staff regularly contact me to see our architectural plans, so I consider them our primary user community. While the plans are the most frequently used material, photographs and historic knowledge about the site are often used for corporate communication and marketing purposes. We also receive frequent questions about the history of the yard and its activities. I will also note here that we receive hundreds of genealogy questions each year. And unfortunately, we are unable to answer them because that information is contained in records that are not under our custody. Personnel records, civilian and military alike, are under the jurisdiction of the federal government, specifically the National Archives and Records Administration. The National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri, contains all personnel files. So those are the folks you should call for your genealogy inquiries related to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. These are some frequently asked questions from our users. In order to provide answers, we need to collect, manage, and leverage the information we have, and that takes resources and labor. However, these questions can be answered by the material under our care. So every day we are working to organize and catalog what we have so we can provide answers to our, to our users efficiently.
Part of our public service mission is ready access to our material in the form of a digital library. In addition to our website, which provides general information about us and our collections, BNYDC also has a digital portal for its collections. We purchased Collective Access, an open source platform that acts as both a digital asset management system and a library for the digital material in our collections. As of today, there are 15,000 individual items ingested in the digital library, and we continue to add more. We use this system to catalog collections, items within those collections, and our acquisitions. An item record will show a digital representation of the item, as seen in this example on the screen, a blueprint, along with associated metadata describing the item. This is a snapshot of the interface only used by archive staff. This is how we upload content and input data about the objects under our care. There are several pieces of descriptive information that needs to be entered in these fields that will help the user identify and understand what the item is, such as the creator, the title, the date it was created, and tags to facilitate searching. Building 92 was once one of two commandant's houses for the US Marines contingent in the yard. The Marines were the security force of the yard. So they were who you met when you entered through one of the gates as shown in the photograph on the left. The Building 92 project grew out of the archives. Remember, the archives was established in late 2003. The yard's first archivist was keen on creating a definitive resource about the history of the yard and she was supported by the administration in creating a gateway for the local community. They chose Building 92 because of its historical significance and its location on Flushing Avenue, which provided good public transit options. The Navy Yard operates as the oldest continuous industrial site in the city, and an important goal of the proposed visitor center was to educate and inspire New Yorkers about the men and women who have worked here from the past to the present. In 2010, they received $10 million in city capital funding to rehabilitate this 1857 building with a 20,000 square foot green extension. The project team began acquiring oral histories and personal effects of former yard workers to grow the collection and inform the proposed exhibition. And yard tenants were involved and contributed to the construction. The electrical work, murals in the exhibit, the counters in the restrooms, the shell of the annex are all courtesy of yard tenants. The Brooklyn Navy Yard Center at Building 92 officially opened on November 11th, 2011, Veterans Day, and is now our visitor center that includes our employment center, which connects the community with jobs in the yard, the three floor permanent exhibition, past, present, future, and is also home to our education programs and tours of the yard. The archives frequently collaborates with Building 92 on the public consumption of the history of the yard, but the center was more of a corollary to the archives' early growth and development. We face many of the same challenges that other cultural heritage institutions face. I have to constantly advocate for the work that we do. This is why the vision of the archives has evolved since 2003. Where the archives was once a place to preserve history and had C-suite support in that endeavor, New administrators are more focused on the future. So I am in the position of educating them that these records are of enduring value. Though they are historical, they inform current endeavors. Moreover, gaining intellectual and physical control over these information assets takes dedicated time and resources, which being the only person in the company who does what I do exists in a limited capacity. I also have to reconcile legacy decisions that were made with the policies and procedures I've since created. For example, it is now policy that we do not care for collections unless we own them, unless they were gifted to us. But when the Building 92 project began, the only material of historic significance under its care were the architectural plans. So the project team aggressively acquired what they could. This led them to a large collection of photographs under the custody of the National Archives and Records Administration. They hold a collection of historic construction photographs of the site that they allowed us to digitize, and it's been a valuable resource to our users. At the time, archive staff used a portable scanner at the NARA facilities to scan the photographs, but the project was never finished, leaving a gap in the collection in our digital library. Finally, due to budgeting constraints, 
Our digital library, which I've often mentioned throughout this presentation, is currently under construction, which unfortunately hampers public access. I wanted to end my presentation with these two clips. A vital piece of discovering the yard's history was collecting stories. So the BNYDC partnered with the Center for Brooklyn History to collect interviews of former yard workers. Yet this collection not only contains the story of yard workers during World War II, but also the Cold War, the click days, and now current tenants of the yard. Information, whether it's an oral history interview, an architectural blueprint, even an email message, are the documentary footprints that we leave on the world. And we need to preserve this information so that we understand the decisions we made and how they've impacted our community. I talk a lot about the preservation of information because it's not just history we're preserving, it's current information as well. Archivists shepherd this current information into the future via means of metadata extraction, standards of arrangement and description, and advising the staff of their respective institutions on how to manage their records. So if you're curious to know about what bus shuttle service was like during World War II, or what union activity was like in the 1930s and 1940s, or who our first tenants were, well, all of that information can be found in the archives. Let's listen to two women's experiences working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. My name is Carmela Zuza. So I worked in the Navy Yard in uh, 1942. I was 18 years old and uh, I, they were hiring a lot of people and most of the neighborhood men worked there. But my father was against me going because uh, he figured going into work in a you know, a plant like that, it's mostly men. So I said, well, let me try it, you know? So uh, they put us in a, a room with what they call mechanical instructors, and they trained us for three months, and I did arc welding. So we worked on uh, parts of the Missouri. We weren't allowed to go on the ship, but we worked on the uh, inner bottoms, overhead welding, and vertical welding. And uh, when we walked into the shop, the men told us to go home where we belong in the kitchen. <laughs> so we all yelled out, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but we showed them up, you know. Mm -hmm. So we worked on uh, mostly uh, the decks of the um, Missouri, wow. which, the, which the men prepared and uh, they were like, forget about it. Welding f went on for months, mm -hmm. but it was a great job. I loved it, mm -hmm. especially the war effort, you know. And I had to go there to work because I had to leave school because two of my brothers were in the service and the other two were married. So my father wasn't well at that time, you know. Someone told me, I think they were, uh, they were interviewing people for the Navy Yard. We were they were going to hire women. And that must have been 1942. Two, it's two. So what we went were interviewed and we had to take an exam which was called uh, we were called mechanic learners which yes. was a new right. title yeah and we were paid about half of what the third class welders were paid when the men got on the club and then at one point i don't know maybe after a year or so we began to ask for equal pay for equal work <laughs> And uh, there was a union, but I don't remember which union. I don't either. They stepped in for us, and eventually we got that one, that dollar fourteen cents an hour, which the men had been getting. We, used to get, we started out with with a new title. They were called third class welders, and we were called when we were hired mechanic learners. So they gave us a fraction of what the men got. About half. Yeah, 60 it's something cents an hour, wasn't it? I thought it was less. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, like 50 cents. So eventually we got the same. Oh, after a big fight. Yeah, and were you then, did yes. you get the title as well? Yes, we got the title. And then from there, I don't know how long a time you got to be a second class welder, which was a dollar twenty six, And then a third class, a first class welder. How many? 
No, it was very It was good. low, but it went from 114 to 126. Oh, I think it was low. Well, it doesn't matter. It was one, very low. To 140-something. But as low as it was for that time, I earned more money than my father. At one point, they, let, they took the women out onto the ship because one of their arguments was when we asked for higher pay that you weren't working on the ship like the men were and we said that we weren't refusing you just weren't sending us out on the ship so they did you enjoy it enjoy the welding i think so i did i did because it's skill and it's, yeah, I did. it's, it's very satisfying to I, think you can do it well i didn't really mind going to work and it was a job So these are the ways that you can get in touch with the archives, uh, both email and online. Uh, so this includes the presentation part of the program. Um, I am going to join Cindy in just about a minute and give you folks a tour of the stacks. So Elizabeth, before we uh, before we step away, that that was so wonderful. I, you know, I just had a, a couple questions, and we've had some questions come in here. Absolutely. Um, but it was so great to get. It was so great to get that that context about sort of the interplay between the archives and public programming and the museum um, that it all sort of started with this pile of maps and, and architectural drawings. That's right. Um, but I, I had a I had two questions. So so the first um, is um, about what you do uh, sort of the other side of your job. Which, which you mentioned here, which is you said one of your key users is, is internal uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Art Development Corporation. Could you maybe give us some examples of some of the uh, requests that you might get and some of the projects that you've worked on um, where the archives are necessary for the contemporary development? Sure. Um, so one big project that happened pretty early on in my tenure as archivist was um, the ground floor of Building 77. So up until 2017, the only publicly accessible uh, space on the yard was Building 92, as I said, the visitor center. Um, and they wanted to open uh, Building 77 as the second publicly accessible place, space. Um, it's a very large building also on Flushing Avenue. It's about 16 stories, I believe. Um, so most of it is office space, but given that many of our tenant businesses are food in the sector of food manufacturing, they wanted the ground floor to be a, a food hub. And, um, and you can also walk through it, grab a bite to eat from some businesses such as Russ and Daughters, um, Pizza Yard, Grand Champs, which is a, a local um, restaurant here in Brooklyn, and then walk your way outdoors um, to the ferry because we now have a ferry stop. So with the ground floor opening, um, they wanted to design the space to uh, reflect history. So uh, when you when you walk through, you'll see several large uh, murals um, of photographs. Um, and uh, that was a project that I worked on. They tapped on us and they said, well, why don't we why don't we use some of the historic photographs um, and design the space in such a way that that shows, you know, the history. And we were particularly looking for um, activity that's surrounded food right so as you're as you're walking through you'll see a very large photograph of um women sitting at a table on their lunch break um they were they were world war ii workers so that was a pretty that was an exciting project um i would say the most typical uh questions that i get um, are related to the built environment. So that's why I, I spent a lot of time talking about the architectural plans because we are not really in the business of creating new buildings. We're all about readaptability and reuse. So um, when we are renovating buildings, whether it's an interior space for a tenant or doing a gut renovation project like we've done with building 77, building 128, building 127, um, the consultants that we that we work with, um, uh, engineers, they need to see those original plans to get that data. And that's especially true with our structures. So um, our dry docks, uh, we have six dry docks on site and um, 
um, they are, they're very old <laughs> and they need, a, they need a lot of work. And we have one tenant GMD shipyard that leases all of those dry docks from us and they need a lot of rehab work. So they often reach out to us because they need to see those original drawings because not only does it depict like it, it um, physically depicts the structure, there's a lot of data, right? Because of the way that dry docks work. So, um, so I would say those are our big, those are, those are the, the major questions that I get. Um, but then you also get just a lot of general history questions. When tenants move in, they're really interested in knowing about the history of their building. Um, so I often provide them photographs and some like, you know, research material that sort of explains um, uh, what, uh, what their building was like uh, back when, when the shipyard was a federal shipyard. And then finally, um, I, I think the Building 92 project, you know, I, I talk that it's sort of genesis was these oral histories that we were collecting. And that's because the author, Jennifer Egan, at that time, which was like 2005, was researching her since published novel, Manhattan Beach. And she reached out to the archives, which again, at that time, the only thing that they were custodian of was the plans, but she wanted to know all about the activity on the yard. She wanted to know what all the women were doing because that's what the novel is about. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, so the, the archivist had to do a lot of um, research at like outside institutions, but then we were lucky enough to connect with these former yard workers. And not only did the first archivist, her name is Daniela Romano, interview several of these women, uh, Jennifer Egan did herself uh, as well. Um, so those are, those are the types of questions that we get. Yeah, and, and I know um, like just a couple of examples from from all of that amazing work. You know, I know um, you did some work right with the with the team at Nanotronics and Building Twenty and their renovation. Is that right? Um, yeah, they did reach they, out. They, they, they mm -hmm. yeah, they wanted to see. Um, they, I remember them asking me for photographs in particular. They were really interested mm -hmm. in what Building Twenty looked like. So, so they did a, a beautiful repurposing of this 1865 brick building that's now going to be a manufacturing facility for making high-tech microscopes. Um, and I think it's just, it's so great to hear about how these, these things really work in concert where you have public programs and that kind of brings people out of the woodwork um, to come in and share their, share their stories. Uh, we had a, a question here. Um, I, I I think I, well, two, two good questions. Um, one is Robert asks, uh, do you have a policy on monetizing the collection? I guess this means like licensing uh, the materials and stuff. My, my guess is that they're pretty much almost all in the public domain because they were produced by the federal government. Is that right? Yes, that, that is exactly right, uh, Andrew. Most of our collections are in the public domain because they were, um, they were created by the federal government. Um, in terms of monetizing the collection, though, um, you know, we, I am very much an advocate for open access um, and making things as widely available as possible. So um, to use our material, there is no charge, um, especially if the material has already been digitized. Um, I would say the only time, and it's, it's very, very rarely happened, is if someone wants to use material for our collection for publication, which means they're making a profit, we would charge a fee. But we, I personally, I treat that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, again, not only because, as you mentioned, Andrew, the public domain piece, um, but also because of my, my personal commitment to um, wide open access. Uh, and then there was one more question, and then we'll we'll move into the next room. But um, it was on one of your slides. Uh, could you tell us a little bit what what is the uh, the Bob Levine collection? Oh, uh, Bob, I think he actually might be here. So if you're out there in the Zoomerverse, Bob, hi. Um, Bob Levine <laughs> connected with Daniela probably, you know, at the during the Building ninety two project, and um, donated. I, I'm sorry, loaned us um, a whole bunch of material, um, old postcards, stenographs, um, all about Brooklyn and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He just has a personal collection of, of Brooklyn memorabilia that he was generous enough to share with us. However, he owns that collection. He loaned it to us so that we could digitize. So that collection is in the digital library. Um, and like I said, it's, it's, it's mostly photographs, postcards, and stenographs. Um, 
but really beautiful artwork and, and material um, that he was generous enough to, to loan to us and um, is now on view. Um, with there is because it's a loaned collection, there are some there are some use restrictions um, that we worked out with him. Um, but yeah, but feel free to visit the, the digital library and, and look at it. Um, these these materials are are highly duplicative, um, but it's really a beautiful collection of of old postcards um, and, and other types of materials. So that that's the Bob Levine collection. And, yeah, and and Bob is here, um, so maybe. Uh, a little bit later on towards the, the end of the program. If, if you want to come on and say hello, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> I don't know how, but um, yes, actually, but yeah, I'm, but keep I'm, your questions coming. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and one last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll walk over to Cindy. Um, yes, that was the original connection. Um, see, I, I wasn't here when all of this happened. So a lot of this information yeah. I'm gaining secondhand, but um, uh, his mother, so, um, so, so I, so, Sidonia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, she's one of the oral history participants and has a great interview that everyone should listen to. And I think that's how the connection was made with Bob. So, so hello, Bob. Yeah, Bob dropped into the chat uh, just to me that um, he says my mother was one of the group of the first six women that that were part of the um, original cohort of women production workers in the summer of 1942. Um, but yeah, so let's let's move to the other room. Hi, Cindy. Uh, so Elizabeth um, is going to go into the other room uh, and hey. Cindy is going to walk around with her. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I will try and speak loud so everyone can hear me. Um, so we are in what's known as the stacks. This is basically record storage. Um, so our corporate records are here as well as many of our special collections. Um, the only special collection that is not here that's in our main office in building 77 are the architectural drawings because um, consultants come there and it's much easier for them to work with the material there. So, uh, so this is just, this is the room. Um, it doesn't have any windows. It's, it's um, under lock and key, which only I have access to, to make sure that it's secure and the material can remain under uh, climate controlled conditions. So why don't we take a walk over here? Okay, and I'm just gonna do a pan so they get a sense of the space. There we go, exciting stuff. <laughs> Andrew says the sound is good, so. Oh, excellent, yeah. okay. So um, if you can just point your camera over here. Okay. Um, so these are um, the archival collections. And I wanted to point these out specifically because if you noticed before, many of our corporate records are in uh, bankers boxes, just normal office boxes because our corporate records aren't kept forever. They're only kept for a temporary amount of time. But the archival collections we keep permanently. So they need a little bit of more tender loving care. And so these types of boxes are, they're made with acid free materials to help, um, to help house papers and artifacts, um, different types of ephemera, clothing. Um, and you can see they come in various sizes to accommodate different types of material. Um, over here, uh, this is just, um, um information that helps us locate material um so we have what's called a collection guide um that's published on our website and it gives all of the contextual information about uh the collection and if it piques someone's interest and they wanted to view the actual item um there is an inventory that will point to the box and the box location so that i can quickly retrieve the item for the user so why don't we take a walk this way And I thought I would end with some show and tell. Um, so we have items from two collections here and then a sign. Um, so I'll explain all of that. So this here, um, this is the uh, Virginia, um, well, let me see if I'm pronouncing her name right, Fairdon collection. Um, this was a donation in the early days. As you can see here, that is her ID badge. Um, it does not have her name but it does have her photograph and a, a, a number. And then I also wanted to show these pieces of jewelry. These were made by women workers at the Navy Yard from just like old material, I think, that was just hanging around the shop. Um, and uh, she, she, she acquired some and I just thought that, I thought that was really neat. It was, it was made with material already on site 
to make these these beautiful pieces of jewelry. That's kind of amazing too, because we now have plenty of jewelry makers inside the making. Exactly. Yard. So there's a connection to the future. Yeah, See yeah, how that yeah. through line works? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's really neat. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to zoom in here so people can get a closer look at this badge here. Um, I'll try to make it so there's not as much shadow. There we go. It's so cool. Yeah, isn't that great? Do you have do you have several of these types of, of badges? I wouldn't like say several. I mean, a small handful from different eras. Um, I know we have a couple from World War One, which again, just a photo and a number. So it's very difficult to ID these people. Right. With yeah. with Virginia. Year, we had a lot of contextual information, so we knew that this ID belonged to her. But there's a couple of World War One era um, badges that we have where we have no identification information, so we just we just have them in our collections. You know, we had a woman come on a tour years ago, and she was wearing jewelry that her father had made for her mother. Um, so that was another. You know, yeah, we do see that too, and that's Aww, that's, that's always wonderful. nice. It's sort of the intersection of the public programs. The tours and, and what Andrew was talking about earlier, like people coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, um, you know, that live here or that used to live here have connections with this site because it's been around for so long. It employed a lot of people. So it's great that people have a real connection to this place. Yeah. So another collection I have here is the um, Arthur Colombo um, collection. And this is a special collection for me because this was an acquisition during my time as archivist. Most of these collections um, were acquired before my time. And uh, a gentleman named Ken uh, emailed me very late to 2018 and said, my grandfather used to work at the Navy Yard. Um, let me just make sure I'm getting this right. He was the, the, the Arthur was born in 1909 in New Jersey and he worked at the yard as an electronics engineer. So he started do, being an engineer and then he moved up to a supervisory role in the design division of the Bureau of Yards and Docks. And the Bureau of Yards and Docks was basically the construction arm of the US Navy. And they were the ones responsible for all of the buildings and all of the structures. And um, yeah, and this gentleman, he, uh, he got in touch with me and said, I have all of this stuff and I'd love to donate it to your archives. And I said, absolutely. And we have a process for donating material. We ask that uh, donors send photographs. We have them sign an official agreement. Um, and he was local. Uh, the, the, grand, the grandson lives in New Jersey. So he was actually able to come to the site. So I gave him a small tour. I was able to meet him. And then he donated all of this material to us. And, and um, a few weeks later, he got back in touch with me. And he was like, that was such an emotional day for me. Thank you so much for taking such good care of our stuff. And I was very touched by that. Um, that's so nice. Yeah. That's so, and, and so what did he, what did he donate? Then? Yeah. So this is basically all like ephemera that he acquired oh, wow. during his 30 year reign. So he, he started in the early thirties and then I think um, like ended his career in the, in like right around the time that the yard was decommissioned. So by just by nature of being on site, he was able to witness the ship launchings, for example. So this right here, he received an invitation to the uh, launching of the of the Kearsarge. And then when he was there, oops, excuse me, I'm gonna hold this for just a second so yeah. we can get a closer look. There we go. Yeah. So that's the invitation. And then he actually attended. So this was the program that he received. Mm -hmm. You can see the date there, March 2nd, 1946. Uh-huh. Oh, that's great. And then I think this was like a souvenir program. Oh, that's, that's fun. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, this is just stuff that he acquired by nature of being a yard worker. Um, and then uh, I didn't want to break this apart, but I guess these were some three-dimensional objects that he, that he got various pins and again you would you would most likely just be hand these things would be handed out right during big events or um of, uh, yeah events of on the yard um it, let's let's if we can yeah uh, we i'm gonna try to no no i'm gonna try to uh, if you want to set that down i'll try to zoom in on some of these here for people to take a closer look okay and andrew let us know how it's coming across visually Make sure. Yeah, it looks good. Great. Okay. 
Oh, could you go back to that thing about the hornet? Sure. Here we go. You see that oh, there? Wow. So this is, yeah, it's an interesting example because the, the hornet was not built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but it, it did undergo a major modernization similar to the USS Intrepid. So Thank I guess for that. They, uh, Thank you for that replaced. context. And if there's anything else you want to see more closely, just let me know, everybody. <laughs> here's another, here's a button. This is neat. The button says 1963, help keep your job, save New York Navy Yard and Annex. Somebody was asking when the Navy Yard closed as a, a federal yeah. shipbuilding facility. 1966. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's great because that obviously, you know, 1964 is when they announced the closure. So there was, uh, there were a number of campaigns in 63 and 64 to try and stop that, including the, the Senate campaign of Bobby Kennedy, but obviously they were, they were unsuccessful. And I just wanted to zoom in if I can get a oh. view of this here, the keychain that shows, I don't know. You might want to back up just a little bit, Sind. Okay. There you Are go. Able to see the keychain, okay? Mm hmm Yep. So it looks like an aircraft carrier of some sort. Uh, keychain from one year of excellent attendance. It says on it. I don't know if you can see that there. I love that. So that's that's CV sixty. It's it's the it's the USS Saratoga. Ah. Okay. Great. Which was built at the yard. And then here we have. Like a Coast Guard identification card. Um, oh, and then there's a New York Naval Shipyard executive dining room. Cool. And this would have been oh. building 77, the 13th floor, it says on there. Mm -hmm. That's kind of neat. Yep. So at That's the time, uh, when building, seven, so was, building 77 was erected in, in 1940, and it was mostly for storage. Um, which is why, if you remember the old construction, most of the building didn't have any windows, and except for the top floors, and that was what what they sort of like colloquially called the nerve center of the yard. The executive officers uh, offices were there. The commandant had an office there. Um, the Bureau of Yards and Docks had an office there. Because of its location, you could really span out and the um the entire yard from one of the top floors of building 77 so that's what that's probably what that is referring to that's so neat. That's and then neat. do we have time to look at one more thing yeah, okay so the last thing i wanted to show you folks was the sign for building 77 speaking of which so as they were doing um over the last 10 years as they were um uh, renovating the building they found this and they said, well, we got to deliver it to the archives. I really hope that one day it can be prominently displayed in Building 77. You know, we keep talking about that through line from past to present. So, you know, the public can see. But, um, you know, Building 77 was a big deal, I think, even back in the 40s. Um, and so they, they made the sign commemorating. Um, ground was broken in 1940. The building was completed in 1942. And here are all of the uh, office, officers. Um, and you can see the the Navy sort of insignia. Ah, yes. We'll get in closer so people can take a look here. Yeah. It's beautiful. It is. I mean, what a beautifully preserved sign. You know, like I said, this 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 sign arrived as is in 2017, and it's in such fantastic condition, especially given what the what the building went through. So, um, okay, well, right, that, that concludes great. the show and tell. So I'm gonna head back over to my computer, oh, okay? Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, I know we're getting close to time, but mm -hmm. um, I'm happy, Andrew, to take any more um, questions or comments from um, our participants. Yeah, I mean, that, that was really great. And it's, it's so wonderful to see all this, this little, um, you know, ephemera, but it can actually, you know, help to really, I mean, I'm always interested in finding those objects and those stories that go beyond the official record, because obviously we have this, you know, run of this weekly newspaper, right, of, of the yard from 1941 to 1966, but um, there's still, there's, there's so much that's, that's missing uh, within the pages of the newspaper as much as it does tell us as well.
Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that I didn't really talk about it, but I, I it was sort of um, laid out in, in one of the slides about our challenges. I would say that uh, something that's been something of a personal frustration to me is that there's more information about the Brooklyn Navy Yard at other cultural heritage repositories than there are here in our archives. And there's a reason for that. Actually, there's two reasons. The first is that, as I keep mentioning, this site was a federal naval site. And when it was decommissioned and then subsequently sold, you know, the Navy is very proprietary and very protective of their records, as, as they should be. I mean, these are, these are weapons. Um, and so they packed everything up. I mean, everything, all of operations records, all shipbuilding plans, all uh, personnel records, and they took them with them. Um, and then another reason is our archives wasn't established until 2003. This place was established in 1801. So you're talking about a, a 200 year gap before there was a concerted effort to start collecting material that reflected all of the activity that was happening here. Um, so there are some gaps in the collection and, um, you know, I mean, we're, we're certainly up for, for mending that um, to, the, to the extent that we can, but that's also why I feel it's so important to collect um, the, the, the current material, so to speak, the now material, so to speak, because we're living now, so we don't really think about this type of thing, but 50 years from now, what our, what our tenant businesses were doing, what Turnstile Tours was doing, <laughs> right? That information needs to be preserved. That information is valuable. Um, you know, you're one of our tenants, you are very valuable to us, and we want to preserve your institutional memory, we want to preserve your legacy, and, and you know, the particulars of that, you know, it, it, we have to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes it means donating products, sometimes it means just cultivating a relationship with a tenant and getting their story. Um, but I think, you know, if we can take a proactive approach to um, acquiring material now, um, you know, we will we will have a, a, a very clear uh, uh, document footprint of, of what was going on or what is going on, I should say. Well, I, I'm always interested in, in the history of tourism. And I will say we're, we're not the first tour company to be tenants in the Navy Yard because Circle Line was a, was a longtime tenant in the yard back in the 1980s. Um, but I also, um, we, we also uh, had a, uh, a question here, which is where do you send people who are looking for Navy records, say from the 1950s era? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the National Archives and Records Administration is basically the archives of the federal government. Um, their main headquarters, of course, is the National Archives Building, which is in Washington, DC. But given the volume of material, as I'm sure you can all imagine, um, that that building um, is really more for like tourism and, and exhibitions. They have additional spaces where they're actively acquiring um, records of the federal government. So not so, uh, uh, the National Archives has what's called Archives 2 in Maryland, um, but then they have satellite campuses all over the country. Um, the one for New York is in Bowling Green in the Alexander Hamilton building. Um, so the National Archives and Records Administration is the, the, the umbrella organization. But to answer your specific questions about Navy records, um, I would highly encourage you to contact Naval History and Heritage Command, otherwise it's NHHC. They're the you know, history preservers and archival arm of the US Navy. Um, as I mentioned, they're located in the Washington Navy Yard. They have a great website. And then the place I also encourage folks under that NARA umbrella is the National Personnel Record Center. They're located, they're centralized in St. Louis, Missouri, but you can make uh, requests remotely. Um, so if you're looking, so I, I sort of tend to um, point folks to that repository because if the, like genealogy wise, um, that's a good mm -hmm. place to look. Um, so yeah, so the National Personnel Record Center and Naval History and Heritage Command. Um, there are some other places that you may know, Andrew. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't well, know. well, one one thing that I, I dropped into the chat was just people should be aware that there was a major fire at NARA St. Louis in 1973. So, yeah. you know, a large portion of the 20th century records were, were destroyed, unfortunately. Um, so the, 
something that you're looking for may not be out there uh, yeah. at all anymore. We'll, we'll, we'll share some more resources as well for, for other links. Um, yeah, and I, I, I you know, I, I use the National, uh, the, the um, Naval um, History and Heritage Command. Their, their website is great. It's, it's really easy to search. It has tons of photos. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll say, I, a couple of years ago, I spent about 12 hours over the course of two days uh, exploring the Washington Navy Yard and especially at their museum. And I was just so jealous at the sheer quantity of artifacts that they have from the Brooklyn Navy Yard on display. So if you want to wow. learn about the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the, uh, the, uh, um, the museum in the Washington Navy Yard is, is amazing. They have the whistle that was blown um, every time they launched a ship and it has engraved the names of all the ships on the side of it. I was like, oh, I wish we had that in Building 92, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, that's, that's amazing. And again, I mean, I know I, I keep saying this, but the reason why it's there is because it, it technically belongs there. I mean, I'm sure if there was right. more than one whistle, maybe we could, we could have a duplicate, but you know, the, <laughs> this is all the property of the US Navy. And so all of that material should be under their custody, not, not ours. Um, but we were lucky to, to acquire a lot of naval objects um, by way of personal donation, right? So I guess you could say they, they're technically the property of the US Navy because they were created by the Navy, but they were given to yard workers. And so now the yard workers are the owners and they donated mm -hmm. them to us, so. Yeah, um, we had another question here and I know we're, we're a couple minutes over time, but um, do you have a favorite artifact um, or object that's, that's mm -hmm. in the collection? I don't. I mean, they're all my children. <laughs> no, 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 I'm I'm being a bit facetious there. Um, we have some Civil War era artillery. Um, I I just think that that's personally like very cool to look at. Like they're just beautiful objects. Um, the sign that I I pointed to before um, that is that I just, I really, really love. Um, and then I guess the final thing would be the, the blueprints, but in particular, the dry dock blueprints. So we have blueprints for nearly every building and every structure in the yard. And the dry dock blueprints, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to, to show them to you, but um, just the artwork and the, the level of design and engineering and all of that data, um, you know, they're, they're roughly 24 by 36. Um, in size and they're absolutely just, and they're, they're still in good condition. Um, and so they're, they're just absolutely like beautiful, like work, I mean, they're architectural plans, but they're beautiful works of art. So I would say those have a special place in my heart too. And I think we should remind people as well that uh, in many ways, the buildings are also part of the, the collection. Um, so, yeah. you know, the, the landscape of the Navy Yard as well is also kind of the collection. It is, it is. And what's really cool about the Navy Yard is how much it's evolved over time. Um, you know, when it was, you know, when those 42 acres of land were, were first purchased, you know, there were, there was really just Admiral's Row, which is now where the, where the Wegman supermarket is. Um, and, you know, over time, you know, uh, you really saw increased activity during the Civil War. Um, I can't, Quite recall if there was too much activity during World War I, but definitely World War II, this place just exploded. And so it's really cool to see. And actually, if you visit Building 92, there's an interactive map where you can see in real time the way the place, mm -hmm. the site itself has evolved. Um, I think that's very, very cool. So it went from 42 acres of land to 236 acres of land, which is remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And I always tell people, and I've said this on past programs, that if you really want to understand the Brooklyn Navy Yard and its, its evolution, you kind of have to go to other Navy Yards because the, the other yards have buildings that we used to have. We have buildings that they don't have anymore. So you yep. can kind of piece together a picture of what the yard looked like over time. You know, and you can visit the Boston Navy Yard and the Philadelphia Navy Yard. They're open to the public. The Washington Navy Yard, kind of. Um, so... Uh, yeah, but but Elizabeth, thank you so much. But before we go, I don't know if um, if Bob is out there. If he wanted to uh, pop on and, and say hello, if if not, that that's okay. Um, I'm going to invite you on if if you'd like um, to to just say hello and tell us a little bit about your your collection. There we go. Great. Yeah, there's always been a piece of my heart there because I'm born and bred Brooklyn to begin with. 
and uh, my uh, mother was one of the first six women that, that went in. So uh, there was an article actually was put out in a local newspaper asking if anybody knew any of these six women, because uh, I guess it was during the time you were trying to open up. Um, and a friend of mine actually saw it and showed it to me and said, isn't that your mother? <laughs> so uh, that was the connection. Um, but uh, I, I learned you had a, uh, some pieces uh, that you had the jewelry, but she had a piece too that are little pieces of wood that were made into a, a, a person, a set of people, two people, very stylish that, that uh, one of the men made for her that was scrap pieces. Oh. I don't know if it's still at the, at the at 192, at 92, but I'll have to bring it in and show it to you sometime. If I have, yeah. That's it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Well, well th yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely be, be in touch. But uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us today and taking us around uh, part of the Navy Yard that we, uh, you know, people don't get to see on tours for sure. But um, this has been this has been really great to give us some insight into your your work. Oh, well, this was this was my pleasure. This was uh, this was an absolute delight. Thank you so much, everyone.